Jordan Peterson and Andrew Tate, right? Why, um, why do these people come up and they're so powerful? No, there's there's not really any man. such I'm, thing I'm as Hinduism. As a Western man, white man, American man, going to Sri Lanka or going to Myanmar, etc., I'm basically going to have a status or a position that is above law enforcement or above government officials. It's not your symbol. And Buddhism is not, you know, yours to, uh, you know, critique or control or whatever. You know, the phones are good enough, the headphones are good enough, the computers are good enough to recognize the reality of a post-scarcity society and start redistributing resources and convert the military to a, um, a generosity force and a resource redistribution force. Do you believe oh. in reincarnation? <laughs> well, I am a 30-year-old Buddhist monk. And yeah, people are looking for community. And if you don't have community one way or another, um, it's going to be very difficult to live That's your life true. in a meaningful way. But do you believe in yourself. reincarnation? This is always a question I want to ask someone. And so when it comes to big religious topics like reincarnation or God, um, someone believing in that or not doesn't really mean anything because we need to define the word in a, a workable way, in a practical way. And so if we are authentically asking that question, especially to a religious person, what you start with is not do you believe in God or do you believe in reincarnation, but what is God? What is Based. reincarnation? What exactly oh, is fuck. this? That, that's because kind of, that's otherwise, kind of sounds what very are you pretty much design? Here's, here's, oh my God. God. Here, here's my question. Here's my question about reincarnation. The idea of reincarnation is that every life form, there's like a static amount of life forms, right? There's like, cause people are constantly being born and dying and being reborn. So they would assume that there's a static amount of life forms, like a constant amount. But that's not what we see in nature. Nature constantly, amount. nature constantly yeah. creates new life forms, at least on earth, and like destroys new and destroys to, others. Um, Nothing know, can be created or to, destroyed, only changed. Yeah, it's thermodynamics, right? But. In this case, you know, I've, I've been a Buddhist monk. This is my fifth year as a Buddhist monk. And I've been practicing and studying Buddhism for about 10 years. So... What do you think of Jesus? You know, I can speak from my experience, oh. but I can't speak, you know, related to your experience or your definition of words because I don't know about it. You don't know who Jesus is? I different people of, have different concepts of no, Jesus. I think, yeah, I think, yeah Jesus if you spent 10 Christ years studying Buddhism, itself, or Jesus is a person. Uh, Jesus has presented in the gospel. Or Jesus is a both. metaphor. Like, a lot of people, Jesus like different like Christians human. see Jesus. My question is, that's, that's is sex. what pushed you into, into Buddhism and wanting what? to study it? Virtuality. Suffering. Suffering? A deep awareness of suffering within myself. Like, how were you suffering? Like, like spiritually, like emotionally? Were you like suffering Almost in like the kind life? Of suffering we all experience one way or another is a sense of dissatisfaction, um, a sense of instability, a sense of lacking, a sense of craving for something that does satisfy. And then just because of traumas that I experienced and, you know, difficulties difficulties in my life and my inability to take care of myself in a skillful way that also led to living in a way that destabilized my mind destabilized my emotions my psychology etc so that put me into a position to search for help and support on the path to deal with that suffering and uh, you know that led me to buddhism as the most actionable practical digestible practice and also philosophy to transform suffering to understand um, you know I, how to deal I with was this. in a uh, situation where I wanted to find the truth like about what our what our universe is so did you find that Buddhism is the truth of like what life is the purpose is you'll find a certain truth at the bottom of a bottle but it won't be the truth that the Buddha taught so you don't think there's a definite truth? 
there is a truth re regarding the fundamental ground of mind or ground of reality that we find ourselves to be present with right now, for sure. Why can't I get him off my screen? I'm trying to look at the Dota. Out here. He's a Buddhist missionary. I've never heard of a Buddhist missionary. Oh, no, they're around. They they're around. Uh, no, they're actually no, around. They're, yeah, they're I don't think. Rare. I don't think Christ questions or questions he's down to answer. I don't know. I've never gotten answers I, out of him for, on those. Yeah. It's I'll, interesting that I'll so wish you many religions. On that, it's but, interesting that so many religions oh want to incorporate. If he sticks, you know. if he sticks around, I'm really interested in having an actual conversation with this monk guy. I've been trying to get a Good talk luck. with him for a while, but yeah, but he is just so hard. It's so hard. It's really it's hard. because Buddhism is not a legitimate yeah, religion. It's no, a, like, it a is. Well, even I mean, okay, I can even say it's not a religion. Yeah. No, yeah, I can, yeah, I can exactly. see that. Yeah, it's, it, not, it's, it's not a religion. It's a lifestyle. Yeah, the more, like the more that. I think about it, it definitely is a lifestyle. Yeah. All right, I can, I there can see that. There is a there. lot of philosophy involved in those philosophies imply like just, a spiritual aspect to things i just but the i thing saw on tiktok that, one day and i was like what the religion. fuck it's not a religion because they don't even believe in a god they don't have a creation story yeah it's more yeah. it's more it's of like a personal thing, at least. i thought wait I thought, uh yo yo Buddhism came from Hindu. noisy worm noisy worm no I'm more or less just really interested because there's a lot of other Buddhists on like YouTube and TikTok yeah. who really, really, really Look are like outspoken against him, and I want to know why. I've heard of a fair amount of Buddhists coming to Christianity through an encounter <laughs> through Christ. And Look at my cookie quicker. It's so much better than yours. But I'm just curious well, yeah, to see like, why there's other people who are super outspoken against him. To be the same God. Yeah, there's a lot of people who do that, but I think they're wrong. You know, you know what the problem is with polytheism? I think we're all attempting to explain the same thing, but I'll see it differently. You, you know what the problem is with polytheism, which is the belief of multiple gods, is that our universe is not designed in like an in like like a way that's like kind of cluttered or whatnot. Our universe is designed in a very precise way. It's, which well, I mean, like, what's, is yeah. there is there a word for the belief that uh, of like multiple interpretations of the same thing? Of like of like there being one god, but like every religion just calls it like God, Buddha, Allah, like but it's all the Isn't same. I'm just the curious if there's a word for that. Jesus Singularity of beyond time and like Yo, the thing that is underlying to the universe, yeah. like whatever the source Look is. My cookie I guess. Clicker. All right, is he well, back? He, he think, might be back. Noisy. We've spent eons and kalpas, Bro, endless so. periods of time talking about Islam and Christianity. Since the dawn of chat rooms, we've been running around in circles talking nonsense. But have we addressed the elephant in the room? What's the elephant? Have we addressed Buddhism? Buddhism have doesn't addressed... even believe in a god. Have we addressed the religion, the philosophy of Buddhism? Is Buddhism and, a religion, and, though? No. We were actually just talking Jesus about this amongst ourselves, and we, we came to the conclusion. Or not? Here, guys, and one at a time, please. Everybody's considered one connected god-like being, no? Yo, what, what are you drinking? How could... How could... Who okay, never mind. Wait, is That's reincarnation a critical part of Buddhism? Yes. Is... Please let him answer the questions you're asking him. Yeah, please let, please let me answer. Is reincarnation a critical part of Buddhism? You see, the thing is about this monk, dude, he won't answer what questions. What I can tell you is this. I'm just telling you that now. No, he might actually just be respectful and doesn't want to talk when there's like five other people talking. Okay, dude. Any, anything that you have a shallow understanding of is going to be ultimately irrelevant and non-practical. So if you isolate reincarnation and you, you know, you're representing that as being... Uh, an expression of Buddhism, like your quite shallow, irrelevant to, in terms of Buddhism and Buddhist study and Buddhist practice, your view of reincarnation and apply that to Buddhism and say, is this fundamental to Buddhism? No, of course it's not. Right? It's like, you know, is is uh, one plus two fundamental to what is fundamental about, to Buddhism? about calculus? Well, no, because you're not involved in it. You don't know about it. You haven't, what is you haven't invested to Buddhism? in it. So we have three marks of reality in Buddhism, three marks of reality itself, impermanence, unsatisfactoriness, and uh, no self, no separate self entity. So this immediately kind of puts the cog in uh, the wheel of, you know, reincarnation and, 
you know, do Buddhists believe that we're in a Pixar movie where you become squirrels depending on what you do? No, that has nothing to do with Buddhism. There's no so point there's three in seeking fundamental marks of reality that are very important, which is impermanence, exist. no self, and dukkha, or this sense of unsatisfactoriness that things tend to not be satisfactory ultimately. There's no point so, to eliminate your karma. It's a big topic. I mean, there's a reason that it's not being broached. There's a reason that people aren't talking about it. And that even though it is a major world religion, even though Buddhism is much more um, dominant in terms of running countries and like re having religious states. So we know about Israel, we know about Saudi Arabia, etc., the Middle East. Well, what about Thailand? What about Myanmar? What about Sri Lanka, Laos, Cambodia, and to some extent Vietnam? What about the history of Buddhism as the dominant form of philosophy in all of the major Asian, Asian countries that are coming up? China, Japan, and Korea. And yet it's totally off the table for our discussion or our, our interest or our curiosity. So it's a curious situation, right? China, Korea, Japan, the number one Asian countries are hev heavily, heavily Buddhist influences, the dominant philosophy there for centuries and centuries and centuries. And you still have fundamentalist Buddhist societies in Myanmar, Thailand, Sri Lanka, Laos, Cambodia. You have Bhutan, right? So it's, it's very interesting and it is worthy of our attention. If you're an intellectual, if you're a philosophizer, if you're someone who's interested in the truth, Whatever it might be, Buddhism is very worthwhile to look into and investigate about. But have you yeah, if you actually Hinduism, look into it, you'll see that the merit system is a is very big a little part bit of Buddhism. But, you know, it, and I don't know why you really can just the same kind of because Hinduism existed in India. So sure, you can learn about Hinduism, but you know, is India a, a modern cultural what the fuck? Um, kind of me? so you know, in the conversation for modern cultural dominance? No, but Korea and Japan and I'm China. Just gonna monk, you later. Monk, Yo, monk, 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 can you hear sex? Also, no, he can't. there's he not really any such I'm, thing I'm as Hinduism. Gonna... So that's hey, it's like a term. What we do you came mean by with, that? What do you mean by that? It's more really that curious. their their animism never uh, was co opted by any other religion. So their anima, animalistic or animistic beliefs pr kind of proliferated and established themselves in all kinds of different ways with all kinds of different stories and archetypes and deities and all that. Uh, so it's, there's not like Hinduism is something that some colonizer, you know, English colonial colonizer came up with and called it. But there's, it's such a vast compendium of um, a very animist, animistic kind of uh, related beliefs and ideas. Hey monk, do, dude, did do you, you believe? Me? Do you believe that there's monk, not? Did you mute sex? Really quick question. Atheism doesn't make sense. You, I no, I think he's just oh, so No, he just has a lot going on. I think I'm pretty sure. Hey monk. Go ahead. So my question is: is um, you said yesterday that you get a lot of pushbacks from other Western Buddhists. And I'm just curious as to where that pushback comes from and like, why do you think that you get that pushback? Not a lot, it's just it stands out against the, you know, the praise because I get much more praise and support and status rather than disrepute most of the time. Um, but so like the, the antagonism or the negativity stands out. But it's just that people have a, Good night, brother. Love you. People have a super conservative uh, version of Buddhism in their mind and like what a monk is. And then there's also that colonizer's disposition, especially for Americans because of the cognitive dissonance that was like established as a fundamental part of our culture and slavery and segregation and all that. So for those people to see like a modern progressive monk who's not shy to sing or to to do things like this or use like a background like this, which is, oh my God, oh my, you know, you can have a conniption about it, but also it's just like, it's a cool, I love it. It's beautiful, it's Buddhist, it's very kind of fresh. Um, so they will have, you know, this isn't a real monk, you know, or this is fake, and they'll try to find ways to justify that. But, you know, ultimately that's not really the case. And, uh, you know, I just continue on my path. But it's much more support than it is negativity or antagonism.
but the antagonism stands out. Yeah, I was gonna say I checked out your TikTok and you and you're pretty popular on that. You get a bunch of uh, you get a bunch of positivity. My next question is is about your path in particular and like, I I don't think you have an agenda really. I'm just curious. Like, do you have a goal? Because you said that like you're a missionary, like a Buddhist missionary. So I'm curious. If no, you have, like, I was a just goal. I was I was just playing around with my friends. That's why I spoke that way. For sure, but like, do you have like this a is, goal with like your TikTok and your like, YouTube? No, no, no. But this, I mean, you could say that this is Dhamma propagation. So it's like my, I mean, you don't have to see it in like a, um, a holy way, but it's like, okay, the importance of virtue, the importance of having an introspective contemplative look at life, the importance of having uh, practical, actionable ways of dealing with suffering. And that's the business of the Buddha. That's the business of Buddhism. That's the bu business of the Buddhist community. And, you know, my mission is here to share that, but also to practice that for myself. So this is like an avenue for me to, like a part of my monk life, right, is to show up and 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 be here and do good deeds and, and be in the present moment and to share out and offer out from my experience. So like I'm able to have a platform as a monk where I can do good deeds in this way and I can talk about the things that I want to talk about because people are curious about it, about a monk or Buddhism. And in a lot of ways, there's like, okay, we've, you know, the conversation of Islam and Christianity has just gone on and on and on and on and on, like endlessly. So you have a, a Buddhist monk show up and, and there's an opportunity to talk about Buddhism. I mean, that, that's, that's, that makes sense. You know, that's a hot shot. That's a, that's a real deal. It is so, a different conversation than what is normally happening. Yeah. I agree with you there. My next yeah. question is, is because I feel like a lot of the times Put why the hot water in there I'm listening to you, but I feel like the reason why we talk a lot about like Christianity and especially like Islam and those like two religions in specific is because they are very integrated with a, a lot of the political environment and especially a lot of the political conversations that we're having nowadays kind of seem to contradict at like face value a lot of those religions for example like when we talk about like gay rights that seems to be very much against like fundamental christianity and like fundamental like islam and stuff like that and so like those religions seem to speak up and push back the most about these like progressive issues that have you know been coming around throughout the years so my my question to you is like how do you feel about these like progressive issues such as like gay rights, trans rights and stuff like that? How do you feel about like, gay rights? I'm an ally. Like I'm, you know, I'm on the I'm on the line um, to support and to do my best to pave a way. And uh, you know, I'm actively involved in you know, mentoring and learning from and being an ally and uh, there's a lot that uh, the Buddhist community and that Buddhism has to offer uh, trans people, non-binary people. Uh, because our view of a self is very fluid. You know, it's not fixed. We don't believe in this real true person and a real true story. And that's the business of Buddhism in a lot of ways. So, um, and then also like integrating compassion into that fluid self view and how we, you know, actionably use those practices. So I've, I've had a lot, a lot of contact with trans, non-binary, LGBTQ plus people in my life and also as my path, uh, in my path as a monk. So I run the, um, you know, the most active meditation discord server, mm -hmm. the most active Buddhist discord server. Okay. In, on the discord, you know, in the discord universe. And we have, you know, trans people in, in positions of leadership and, you know, we, um, you know, I consider myself an ally I support as much as I can my my next question to you is is so like so with that take i kind of can see why buddhism isn't talked about as much is is because like i, I feel like it's not as controversial as a religion as like christianity and islam have been have kind of like become recently you know like more and more like every day you know like younger people more like left-leaning people like are talking about how these religions are kind of bad and like buddhism doesn't get brought up because it's not really seen as bad so I guess what's what's your thought on re religion as a whole being seen as controversial slash like being looked at negatively? No, we need a we need a virtue system, and we also need a um, well we need a virtue system. That's the major thing. We need a, um, a a context and a container for virtue. 
So that's what religion has offered throughout history. So if we are saying, like I know a lot of work is being done on the, the super intellectual level about you know, racial justice and, and all these kinds of things, but there's also a, a, a lot that religion offers in terms of a container for community and for social cohesion and for encouragement to live a virtuous life and to do good deeds and to have a relationship with something that's more real than your complicated view of yourself. So that's important. And, you know, we're ready to throw the baby out with the bathwater, but we're not ready to look at the baby and look at the bathwater and be there in that moment and, and kind of, we don't have the, the capacity to do that so much. So, And why do you think that is? Um, well, a lot of it is the American, the American virus. You know, and I, this isn't something that I've that I've put a lot of thought into, but basically the the transition from, you know, being the la one of the last major world powers to to go from slavery, to segregation, and then all those people stayed and integrated, and then to the the propaganda machine of um, racism, and also the advertising, right? So our media system of consumption and deception and belief. And so it's this kind of virus. And then there's also all this cognitive dissonance because the enlightenment and people were really starting to get a progressive mindset and all of this was starting to enter the culture. And so these white people had to apply and, and generate cognitive dissonance, powerful cognitive dissonance to continue doing what they were doing. And it was a, a fundamental part of our society and our culture. So, now we're in a position where there are a large group of people who are empowered and, and really relevant to the conversation of our culture and our society, black people. And then you have um, this other side, which is white people, especially wealthy white people, who are directly linked to this cognitive dissonance of slaver, slavery and um, segregation and all that jazz, you know, and all the propaganda that moved from it. And it, it's just a mess. You know, we need to do reparations. We need a contemplative, introspective approach to how we see ourselves and how we see ourselves as a member of a community. Hmm. Interesting. Very interesting. I'm definitely, um, I'm taking some notes here. I definitely want to have, like, another conversation with you. I just want to, like, buff up my knowledge in some of these things you're talking about. Yeah, there's a lot of good stuff in here for sure, but it, none of it is a replacement for being in community in a contemplative and introspective and compassionate way. And that's not something that we as Americans are, are trained to do or have a cultural background to do. We only have celebrities. We don't have, um, nobody in our society represents virtue or goodness. So, you know, why does Andrew Peterson and, uh, no, Andrew Tate and, uh, Andrew Peterson is somebody I knew from high school. I don't, you know, why like is Andrew Jordan Peterson, Jordan Peterson and Andrew Tate, right? Why, um, why do these people come up and they're so powerful and they're so, uh, you know, et cetera, because we've lost this massive part of what we need as a society and as a community, which is people who embody and, and represent this empowered virtue, this empowered goodness. We don't have this in American society. We have Coca-Cola and Brad Pitt and the TV shows and the movies and et cetera, et cetera. And we have these crazy, you know, completely out of their mind, you know, uh, people in extreme cognitive decline as being the politicians running the country. So no one is representing, you know, real virtue, real morality, real goodness. And so people like Andrew Tate just come up and say, hey, I'm the guy. And you say, oh, yeah, I guess he is because he's passionate about the nonsense that he's spewing. And he's powerful. Andrew Tate's a powerful guy. He's a kick. He's a kickboxer, you know, world champion kickboxer. Mm -hmm. Now I'm not gonna try to I'm not now I'm not gonna try to equate you to Andrew Tate and in, in popularity, unfortunately. That would be a cool world. But um I I am curious, like, do you see yourself as representing virtue? Sure. Well I, I represent being a monk. 
So that represents virtue. I represent the Buddhist path, which is foundationally on, on virtue, on living a skillful life, on renunciation, to renounce greed, to renounce hatred, to renounce complicated or negative or non-practical thinking. I'm sure Andrew Tate would say the same thing. Yeah. Well, he can say the same really? thing, but it's it's not it's going to be from a background and a pra an active practice of money making. So, what is the purpose of it? Why is he saying these things? Why He'll is he continuing to? Home. As a Western man, white man, American man, going to Sri Lanka or going to Myanmar, etc., I'm basically going to have a status or a position that is above law enforcement or above government officials. Yeah, that's why I tried to well, pretense I, before with like, I does he, he have do a it. goal? And it doesn't really seem like he has a goal, whereas like Andrew Tate has a very clear goal to like make money and like, you know, fuck bitches and stuff. And he view, yeah, he views uh, a value of himself by how much people he can lay control and money he can get out of people. It's like, uh, it's, I go the whole trafficking thing. His control over individuals and popularity makes him feel more powerful, which in a sense it kind of does, and uh, make him more powerful because of, like influencing shit. But um, it's more of a quantifiable measure on his part than it is. This is more like I'm a Buddha, and by virtue of Buddhism representing X, I therefore represent X as well. True. <laughs> He has left the room. You get Chad. This is going way more fantastic, honestly, than I thought I than I could ever hope for. Uh, I appreciate no, everyone for be... being respectful and like letting him talk. I really, really appreciate you guys for that. Yeah, I have so many issues regarding with, uh, what he said about rebirth. I don't, I don't know if he called it virtue. I, I, had, I personally have a lot of issues. I'm I'm taking notes because I, I I want to I want to invite him to like a one on one conversation later down the line. I mean, but I wanna long. I wanna like hear some of his claims first, make notes on them, so then I can do some research on what he's talking about. For example, I'm like what Hinduism being co opted. Green? Uh, it being animistic, I'm curious about like China, Korea, Japan being heavily Buddhist, uh, Cambodia uh, was mentioned and stuff yeah, like that. Yeah, so I mean, it's, a, it's an interesting case that you don't know about this, right? Like with yeah. China and Japan and Korea especially. Like it's interesting yeah. because the dominant philosophy, <clears throat> a major dominant religion and philosophy throughout China's history was... Drum roll, please. Well, yeah, it was Buddhism. Yeah, Buddhism. Buddhism. Yeah. Right. And the philosophy of Buddhism and Buddhism is a way of life and Bo Buddhism is a system of virtue and Buddhism is a system of contemplative, introspective practices leading to transcendence of se a self, a false self. Um, so, it, you know, and the same is true of Japan and Korea and, uh, you know, a major reason that Buddhism was is not as prevalent in those countries, it still is foundational to their culture, is because there was military action, government action taken against the Buddhist monks and the, the Buddhist society as a whole, especially in China. There was a war between the Chinese government and Buddhist monks. M multiple times it happened. All right. All right. Sorry, I'm like stuck here trying to think of a good question to ask you. I love your background. But do I, I mean, do I represent virtue? No, I, I represent the robes. I represent Buddhism. And, you know, if you look into what a monk's precepts are and what our way of life is and the intention behind it, then it represents the intention to be virtuous. That's what I represent. I represent the intention to be virtuous the intention to be contemplative, introspective, the intention to renounce, the intention to rely on present moment awareness. But I'm not a enlightened or some, you know, this or that or whatever, but it, that intention is there. And the reason that I wear these robes, the reason that I live at a monastery, the reason that I shave my head and then I've, you know, been living as a Buddhist monk for the past five years is because of that intention. But there's no like holier than thou aspect to it outside of particular contexts where they, you know, they want that that energy to be there in Buddhist societies like 
Thailand, Myanmar, Sri Lanka. These are fundamentalist religious societies with an entire priest class. People don't know about this. It's really interesting, right? You, you think, think about religious about societies, this? you think about, you know, uh, Saudi Arabia, Muslim people, right? But imagine if there's a, a country that is 99%, 90 plus percent um, devotionally Buddhist, and there are a class of people who are the, the royalty of Buddhism, so to speak. This is just for ways of speaking. Uh, you know, this could be inflammatory, but, and these people are all over the country all over the time as like a, you know, as a priest class, as a high, a royal high priest class. That's what you have in Thailand and Myanmar and Sri Lanka and to a lesser extent, Cambodia and Laos because those countries were destabilized and also to a lesser extent, Vietnam. But, you know, this is like this, what I'm talking about here is fundamental to Chinese history and culture. Every Chinese person, if they know about the culture or the history is going to know exactly what I'm talking about. It's different now. They've done a lot of work to extricate that um, alternative power structure to the monks and the Buddhist society from those countries. But that's how it used to be. <clears throat> so my, my next question would then and be... And it's how it is in Sri Lanka and Thailand. You know, if you're a monk, you're royalty everywhere. In the post office, in the airport, in the government offices... As a, as a Western person, just an example to kind of mm -hmm. make it clear, as in a lot of ways. For sure, for sure. Yeah. So that's how religious these societies are, how kind of devotionally uh, Buddhist they are. All right. Are you ready for... So my next question is, is, is like, why, why, do you think the, is, why do you think Buddhism isn't more known about? Like, why do you think, like, we as a Western society aren't made more aware of these countries and, like, these societies and, like, the structure and stuff like that? It's subtle. And we don't buy into subtlety. We want the gross. We want the BMW. We want the Mercedes-Benz. We want the Andrew Tate. We want the... You know, something that inflames us, something that's like us going into the fridge and pulling out Oreos and milk. And Buddhism isn't that. It's anti-inflammatory. Um, now, it's not always. There are extremist Buddhist monks in Myanmar. You know, I'm, I'm inflammatory at times. You know, people are people. But the, the, the fo foundation of Buddhism is inherently secular, really, in many, many, many ways. And it's inherently anti-inflammatory. And it's emphasizing in a, in a structured way, like in an established way, that Hinduism is very fractured, very multifaceted. And there's all kinds of deities and entities and beings like that. So there's not like a core philosophy of Hinduism that can be established or something you can call Hinduism. It's not really true. It's all kinds of different traditions and sadhus, monks, different people. But Buddhism is... We have a, 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 the same canon, all traditions and sects, uh, in, you know, for the most part. And you have this philosophy of suffering, the cause of suffering, which is desire, the ending of suffering, which is uh, nirvana, peace, and then the way to end suffering. And that's the Eightfold Path. And that's broken down into sila, samadhi, panya, which is living a virtuous life. Sila, our virtue, our ethical living. Samadhi, which is our contemplative, meditative practice. And three, Panya, our insight. So insight into the nature of the mind. Right? What's one of the biggest memes in the West right now? Like one of the top, top, top memes in the West? Meditation. And it's been up there for a long, long time. Meditation, Buddhism, Zen, all these kind of perspectives, but it's subtle and it's anti-inflammatory. And Americans in particular, and this virus is kind of spreading, is to inflame, to inflame, to inflame. And I think it has something to do with cognitive dissonance. To stay in that state of cognitive dissonance, you have to actively deceive yourself. You have to actively inflame and self-stimulate. Otherwise, you, you kind of fall apart. You look at yourself, you have a breakdown. And this is more human than it is anything else. I'm not specifically saying, you know, American virus or whatever, but it's just a human thing. So, so how do you think meditation is seen as a meme? I'm really curious about that one. 
It's just a sales point. It's a belief point. It's a uh, communicable way of, uh, you know, oh, meditation is real. That's like the meme. That's the meme aspect of it, right? Meditation is real. Most everybody believes that. And, um, you know, that's spreading in our society. But where does that come from? It doesn't come from the uh, pharmaceutical industries that used to sell heroin, but are now, you know, selling, you know, now they switched up and we all just forget about that or whatever. Um, yeah, meditation is real. Buddhism is real. That's the meme. I see, I see. So a lot it's of like people it's are trying to more. sell meditation. A lot of people are promoting, you know, celebrities. Oh, I did a meditation retreat. Da, 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 da. It's not coming from America. We didn't talk to the slate, you know, the patriarchs and the matriarchs that came out of slavery because of the intense amount of adversity they went through and how they had to like transform that and become empowered people. Right. We didn't consult with them about, well, what, you know, what's med spirituality or meditation? It was this massive wave that came in from the East, some from India, but a lot from Japan and a lot, you know, Buddhist influences. And it's a powerful, powerful meme. I never have any, I mean, I'll be honest. I never have anybody, you know, well, what about this? What about this? And I'm like, oh my goodness, you know, you're right. Buddhism is a uh, unskillful or irrelevant. It is relevant. It's just a matter of, you know, if you know about it or not, and then you can speak on it. But if you're ignorant, and this is also a massive Western phenomena and a human phenomena, but it's this confidence about being ignorant. And kids especially, they, they love this. They're just so juiced up on this. I don't know about something, but I'm confident that I don't know about it. And I'm just going to go straight ahead. So it's this disrespect to our introspective qualities. It's this spitting on our curiosity, spitting on our sincerity, spitting on our contemplativeness. Everybody wants to protest the moment that there's an opening. Ah, what is this? This is crazy. This is insane. You know, we've got to stop this. This guy's a criminal. No, you're the criminal. Let go of whatever you're fixated on and open up to learn about something that you're curious about and that you don't know about. And you may find in the, the practice of investigation and curiosity that you say, oh, yeah, this guy's, you know, a phony or I don't like him or whatever it is. Right. And then, you know, whatever, throw it in the trash. But the more that you can work with that curiosity and that exploration uh, from the Buddhist perspective, that's how you can start to get into a deeper understanding about the, the principles of the mind and how the mind works, rather than just the stories and concepts of the mind. For sure, for sure. All right. Um, I, only, I only have two more questions for you personally. Um, this is a, this particularly, uh, a couple people tried to ask you about this last night, and I was kind of curious about it myself. Um, so like, this is a very politic focused discord. And so I was curious because you are in here quite a bit. I do see you around. Are, are you yourself, uh, politically active at all? Like, would you say you're like at all involved with politics? This is extreme. I mean, in a, if you're being generous with the word of politics, this is being extremely active, extremely active. Um, but am I, you know, do I have a political agenda? Not necessarily, but I am an ally and, um, you know, I am here to support in my local community, especially the um, the rights of trans people and non-binary people, and you know, right, you know, be aware of race and and uh, all these you know practices. I do want to support and be aware of. For sure, and like, what do you? How do you feel about the current racial issues going on in America in regards to like Black Lives Matter and stuff like that? It's not so much my role to comment on it, certainly not to criticize it, uh, but I'm hopeful and, um, you know, I hope that it will continue to, to work out somehow, but we have major, major issues, especially the House and the Senate and like the epitome of that or the representation of that is 85 year old people being in the most important position of our society when you wouldn't let someone like that run a McDonald's. 
a strong agree there. I'm not going to lie. That's so a strong agree. that's, and that's one of those things. Like there's a lot of things that our, our brain physically cannot grasp just like the differences in size. I don't know if anybody is aware of this, but we have a, like the physicality of our brain has a certain capacity to grasp, um, differences in size. So like uh, something to ratios, like we can understand the difference between a computer and a house and maybe a house and a mountain. But when you start talking about a mountain and the planet Earth, this is weird territory. You start talking about a, uh, the planet Earth and the sun, this is weird territory. You start talking about a mountain and the sun, the conversation's over, right? And because we physically, the brains physically cannot grasp these differences, it's very exploitable. It's very easy to exploit this lack of understanding. So it goes with like the ultra wealthy as well. We can't comprehend the difference between ten thousand and a hundred hundred thousand dollars, versus and let alone a hundred thousand versus a thousand, right? But now the interesting thing is that money has a practical value. It doesn't have an absolute value. It has a, a relative practical value according to the needs of a human being and by extension, the needs of a community. So when you talk about 100,000, you don't have to go to a million to get to like the next layer of mind boggling. You can go from 100,000 to 200,000 to 300 every time it's exponential because there's a practical relevant value of money. So when you talk about a million, two million, three million, four million, you're talking about total exploitation, total madness that no one would accept if they could physically understand it, but they can't. So it's exploitable, but it's not necessarily remediable in a material way or a practical way, especially to the point that it's gotten to now. I see. I see. Yeah. So my last and final question is, is why Destiny's Discord in particular? Like, are you a fan of Destiny at all? There's no such thing as Destiny's Discord. This is a public gathering space. It's like going to a park and saying, well, this is Rockefeller Park, or this is a green park, or it's, you know, it's four o'clock or it's six o'clock. What about that? So what? I'm, you know, I have arrived in the here and the now. I'm aware of my body. I'm aware of the br my breathing. I'm guessing that you're also a human being. So you have a body, you have a breathing, you have a heart, right, etc. And this is very important and fundamental. And it's vastly more fundamental than, you know, destiny.ggg. If there were other public gathering spaces that I was aware of that had this level of active VC, then I would spend more time there. I wish I knew about more places that had active VCs in this way. I totally got uh, you it, on a server you would absolutely love. Send me those DMs, as many as you can, okay? Yeah, I got I you, really bro. I really appreciate it. Yo, why do you have a with active VCs? in your background, by the way? And so the that, swastika so is a... That's, that's on, the, guys. I just, I just, I just want to open it up mm -hmm. and say that's all the questions that I had for you, my, my man. I really appreciate your time and you answering all my questions. I, I really do appreciate that. I appreciate everyone else for not interrupting you and letting you answer. Anyone else had any questions? I'm I'm done with my one v one here. Thank you so much for your guys' time. I really appreciate it. That's a, a manji symbol. Uh, cool. Utilized by the name. Nazis <laughs> to pervert it, which is why they reverse it and use it as a Nazi. Yeah. Symbol. yeah so it's so used it's, like you'll it's see really it on important. a map. It's really like important to recognize the the colonizer's mindset. You don't own it. You're not in charge. It's not your place. It's not your position. Get out of the way. You don't know about it. And the only knowing about it you have is, oh, Hitler. Well, you know, so what? That's your, that's your problem. Put it down. Buddhism and the origin of Buddhism and Buddhist countries and other societies outside of America are not referencing English for how they live their lives. They're not referencing like uh, our social norms for um, their culture and their society, especially when it comes to something like Buddhism where there's hundreds and thousands of years of roots and culture there. There's this richness there that we as Americans can't even imagine. So you've got to drop that colonizer's mindset. It's not your symbol. And Buddhism is not you know yours to, uh, 
you know, critique or control or whatever, whatever it might be. It has nothing to do with you. If you invest in it, if you get involved with it, if you get brought into it, that's a different situation. But if you're, if you're not, then you can't really speak on it. You say, oh, I don't, I don't know about that. That's kind of strange. You know, oh, it's a Buddhist symbol. It was a Buddhist symbol way before, you know, a meth head named Hitler came around and, you know, may he, may he be free, may he be free from suffering. Um, it was way before that. And it's not the Buddhist iconography is not there for Western people to, you know, critique or have an opinion about. That's not what it's for. It's not related to that. And like things like cultural appropriation, I think there's a really interesting, there's a lot of really interesting discussions to have around those topics. I mean, some people, you know, say to me that I'm culturally appropriating Buddhism, but none of those people have ever had like the, the gumption to talk to me about that in a way that I can understand and say, oh, you know, that's interesting. Uh, quick hmm. question. What... What is the Buddhist take on, say, things like space exploration? Oh, fuck. There's not a creation story in Buddhism. Okay, so... It's like, for me, it's like... If, is it? Would you find it something that, like, we have enough to deal with on planet Earth and we got to focus on ourselves? No, these people are, these people are lunatics. Space, space explorers? No, Elon Musk, the people who are leading the country, the millionaires, okay. the billionaires, 99% of them are, you know, it shouldn't speak like that, honestly. But what I can say is that amount of money, it leads to cognitive dissonance and it leads to a really powerful disconnection with reality. And so when you're not connected with reality, you're not grounded, um, you, you focus on things that are really not practical and not grounded and not relevant to the lives of most people. You know, I, we can't even imagine having a hundred thousand dollars in the bank. Our lives would be completely, totally, vastly different for most of us. A hundred thousand dollars, here you go. Do what you want to do. We're not talking about, you know, and then, like I said, it's exponential. One to 200,000, two to 300,000. And there's a very, there's a lot of practical uses for money. So it's not like it's irrelevant or it can't be used. It, it can be used. It's very practical in the world four to five to five to six, you know, everyone is exponential. And we're talking about people who have hundreds of millions of dollars. They are out of their minds in a lot of ways, I imagine. So, um, so what you're saying yeah, so is space exploration uh, is too expensive and there's better things to spend money on. Uh, pretty much that's it. Like that would, that would help improve our planet now or people now. It's a good idea. It's a good intention. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. It's like space exploration. is such a crazy thing to think about when we have a whole planet that like we haven't even fully explored and there's still like people that need to be fed and housed and we're right, like, we can, we can push that till later. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Like, like technological and scientific advances that have been, discovered due to working in space right yeah but you so can also like say there isn't that a benefit to it that helps but you can also say the that that's an it's been enough okay. it's enough we're at a point where it's enough and like are the headphones yeah. are good enough now they're wireless the phones are good enough i mean way good enough everything can now for the most part be in an ideal world in a different government be nationalized and, you know, maybe the progress of development is going to be a little bit slower, but it's probably not because cooperation is always more effective than competition. And the only argument for, you know, the space race is that competition forced or encouraged cooperation. There are other ways to encourage cooperation, collaboration, right? So, okay. you know, the phones are good enough. The headphones are good enough. The computers are good enough to recognize the reality of a post-scarcity society and start redistributing resources and convert the military to a, um, a generosity force and a resource redistribution force. Sure. Use money. Yeah. I mean, use gun. 
I'm not going to tell, you know, I'm not going to say it, but if that's what you want to do, if you're transitioning at least, okay, do a forward operating base of generosity in Sierra Leone or someplace in Africa or Ghana, etc. And let it, but, but for all this to work, you need people who have wisdom. You need people who have compassion. You need people who are um, virtuous and have empowered their virtue. And we don't have those structures in our society to to empower those people or, or to put them in those positions. Well, I think democracy kind of does that. Well, I have a, I have no, a question yeah. and a follow-up. I wouldn't say that. We also have institutionalized uh, pressures in a sense. Monk, like, do you, uh, our, you, know, Monk, do you think if we understood the issues we had better, we would be able to goals. cooperate better? In your ideal it's world, focusing on the, the positive subjective. intentions. There's do you nothing want... subjective about the virtue or doing good. Um, it's just a matter of trial and error, and then you become more skillful at it. So what, when you do good, you feel good. When you do bad, you feel bad. Who cares about Ted Bundy? Throw him, throw him away. Don't, don't bring up that argument. Um, so the more that you try to do good, the more that you prioritize doing good and taking care, uh, the more that you learn about what works and what doesn't. So our, our mind regulation um, can actually be very scientific as well. But you have to you have to prioritize virtue, otherwise you're not going to be working with it in any meaningful way. You're right. not going to be showing up to it. So it's said that the people who want to debate and philosophize about what's good and what's bad and ethics and all that are the people who are not really involved. So they don't actually know about it through their own experience. Okay, but wouldn't oh, you say shit. being that able to, my mind. like, wouldn't you Come say on, be, that? Be nice, all right. Good is something that is sociocultural in a sense where no. we learn it based on our culture. Like, I mean, that's, up, that's a part of it. Middle, if you grew up in the middle of the woods country. with wolves, are you going to know the difference between good and bad? But this is just what I said. It, you know, you're raising a family or you're like, we're so isolated now that we think that there is no present moment or there's no such thing as community or that the only way we can interact with one another socially is by buying or consuming or voting, right? Oh, vote for that, vote for that. Or I believe in that virtue signaling, right? And virtue signaling can be okay because we find out what our mutual, our mutual inspirations is, yeah. are, right? It's not ironic because... Virtue signaling is just human. Like, this is what I value. This is oh, what I yes. don't. Yeah. So in that case, you know, gun owner saying, you know, I've got a gun. You're virtue signaling. You're doing the same thing, whatever it might be. You know, I, democracy is the way to do it, and we shouldn't do that. That's also a form of virtue signaling. It's just value signaling more so. Anyway, the point is that we take an active role in taking care of a child or taking care of a relationship or taking care of a community and we find what works and what doesn't in the present moment, in a practical, engaged, humanistic way, not in a philosophical way. And look, where, where are all the philosophers, where are all the philosophers that are eating grapes and drinking wine and, and hanging out? Well, they're all gone. Well, the Buddhist monks aren't gone. Our philosopher class isn't gone. Our renunciate class isn't gone. So, you know, you need to look at it a little bit more deeply and, and not rely so much on this kind of broken school of philosophy that led to psychology. And that now is, I'm just spitballing here. I, you know, I, sh I, I, should I mean, one that. could argue that, that like the, the old age of philosophers that like drink wine and ate grapes just kind of evolved in the philosopher that like sits on discord, and like drinks beer and eats Cheetos. All right, that's a little bit too generous. <laughs> that's a little bit too generous, but uh, sure. I mean, because they had the support of like the 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 leaders of the society. That's how they were able to do it, right? And so they had those villas. True, true. Yeah, I, I'm definitely being extremely generous with that analogy. But <laughs> so, like, do you believe in communism, my guy? I, I, you talk about like how like a lot of these major companies can just be like nationalized at this point because they're just like good enough. I, I do for me, like, I have a we've got to a point. I have the hot take that. of like McDonald's and all those fast food chains should be nationalized. I don't think any of those things places should exist. I think um, independent businesses should exist and have like availability to prosper and be quite successful. But like McDonald's and Burger King and you know what that trash. All of Although, like, if mega people corporations want to eat it, that are like over commercialized. 
Yeah, if people want to eat that stuff, let them eat that stuff. But all of those businesses should be nationalized. And all the people who work there should get a good pay. And all of the profit should go to local community. And we should focus primarily at the beginning on rebuilding the inner cities and the people who have been um, affected by, you know, redlining and, and, you know, segregation and all that stuff. Rebuild the inner cities, fuel the fuel those pockets. Um, yeah, it's good. That's the way to do it. That's yeah. That's crazy. I never I thought about it that way. Like, uh, there really is no thing. reason for like McDonald's and Burger King and all these like Yo. like highly commercialized like giant mega corporations to like still be independent. Like I, I fucked up, guys. I fucked up a lot time. of joiners. Person wanted to ask yeah, a question. Um, yeah, it was me. Uh, so yeah, you yeah. Um, so my question was basically, I'm sure you get this question like a lot, but, uh, like what is Buddhism? Buddhism like, is a, Buddhism is a practice, um, founded on the praxis of a recognition of suffering and a recognition of the cause of suffering as being our, as our, our desire and our grasping, our self fixated grasping. So that, and, and then also a recognition of a possibility to end suffering and then following the path of ending suffering, which is virtue, meditation, and insight. That's what Buddhism is. Okay. Dope. Thanks. Yeah. You guys can yes. do karaoke? We can do karaoke. Would you guys like to sing a song together? <laughs> oh, hell no. Yeah. Yeah. Let's, right. Let's do it. So the first round, you guys just listen so that you get the, the tune of the song and the way to sing the song, but you can join in the hand motions. So this song has hand motions. It. So the first time, just listen to the tune, and then the second time, you can sing along with me. I am free. So that's the first part. Let's try that together, okay? Yeah, that was like really to... calming. That was that was yeah. that was nice. But now you have the chance to actually practice it. So it's not meant to be a performance, but it's actually a practice. So we can harmonize together. All right. You ready, Bean? I saw your mic unmuted, so you sing along, okay? Everybody ready? Yeah. First part. Yeah. Breathing in, breathing out, breathing in, breathing out. 